You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hi, I'm Seth Peterson. Hi, I'm Debbie Hedren. I'm Rhonda Schwartz. I'm Josh Roberts. This is Jesslyn Gilson. Hello, I'm Victor Webb. Hi, this is Charlotte Ross. Hi, this is Ed Begley Jr. What's up, you guys? This is AJ from the Bash. Hi, this is Shannon Elizabeth, and you're listening to Talking Pets. Talking Pets. Talking Pets. And you're listening to Talking Pets. Talking Pets. Talking Pets. With John Patch. John Patch. You're listening to Talking Pets with John Patch. Hello, America, and welcome to Talkin' Pets with your host, John Patch. Join John and his expert guests with all of your pet questions, concerns, comments, and stories. Now it's time for Talkin' Pets with your host, John Patch. And welcome to Talkin' Pets, heard coast to coast on your favorite radio station. This is Talkin' Pets, and I'm John Patch. Joining us is Dr. Lisa Santonzi from... From the Hillsborough County Pet Resource Center in Tampa, Florida. And also Dr. Vince Santonzi. From the Hillsborough Community College Veterinary Technology Program in Plant City, Florida. Here to answer your medical questions, your behavior questions about your pets at 844-287-2876. When you call into that number, you'll speak with Mr. Zach Buden. Howdy doodly. And he'll put you on the line with us. That's 844-287-2876. The show is produced in-house, in-studio by the ever-so-lovely and talented Mr. Bob Page. Oh, hey, what's going on? Hi, Bobby. Lovely. Welcome back. Thanks. (laughs) 844-287-2876. That's 844-287-2876 is the number. We should have joining us in a a few minutes, actually, the uh, host of Is Your Dog a Genius from Nat Geo Wild. We'll be uh, speaking, actually, with Dr. Brian Hare. He's a dog scientist. So we'll hopefully be talking with him in just a few minutes. But we do welcome your calls and questions. The lines are open. Again, 844-287-2876. You're listening to Talkin' Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Lisa Santonzi. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. And again, this is Talkin' Pets. And once again, you're listening to Talkin' Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Lisa Santonzi. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. The number to call is 844-287-2876. Are you guys a Bruno Mars fan? I saw Vince I've bopping heard, up and I've down, heard and the I name. saw you moving. I've, I, I like that song, but I'm not I'm not familiar with it, but I like it. It's a great song. I yeah. just, a great I know he's song. supposed to be like this hot new thing, but I, I really don't know new mu- new music. I don't not know so new music much new either. anymore, but he is he is a hot thing, but yeah. not so much new. He's yeah. got, got a good sound like out that there. Song. I just always shake my body to the music. Yeah? Yeah. Does he? Sounds like a, a disco song from the seventies. Is he like one of those Tom Cruise kind of guys that runs around in his BVDs and dancing no. to the music around the house? Um. Uh, well, uh, my, I lips <laughs> it's fu- it's <laughs> my lips are sealed. It's it's funny because my lips are sealed. Just so everybody knows, Doctor Vince and Doctor Lisa are actually married. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, uh, and Doctor Vince, Vince is sitting there going, hmm, "What is she going to say?" <laughs> I can see his the brain was like the wheels were turning. You know, that's why I have a good sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> what? Because you don't look good in your BVDs? Is that why? <laughs> no, because we've been married for... <laughs> How long? 20... Uh, Uh-oh. It'll be 22, 22 in August. Oh, there you go. Mm-hmm. The sweat was starting to pour I down was. his forehead. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can not You can never not give dates. No, you can't. You shouldn't even <laughs> attempt to try. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's why some people... I, I honestly think some people get married on a holiday because mm-hmm. they'll always remember, Bobby. <laughs> it's a great idea. Mm-hmm. We did July 4th. I mean, there was a lot of reasons behind it, but it worked out really well. I'll never mm-hmm. forget. Yeah. 
Well, I want to welcome onto the program a very special guest. He is the host of Is Your Dog a Genius? He's a dog scientist. His name is Dr. Brian Hare. And um, the show is called Is Your Dog a Genius? It's going to be premiering on Nat Geo Wild on May 15th at 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time. And to tell us a little bit about the show, Dr. Brian Hare. Hey, doctor. Hey, how, how are you doing? Today? We're doing good. I want to introduce you to the doctors in the house, Dr. Lisa Santonzi and Dr. Vince Santonzi. Hello, Hi, Dr. Dr. Hare. Hare. Hey, great to meet y'all. You too. It's a pleasure. We're all excited about your show, and uh, thanks to Nat Geo Wild, we do have copies of our own here. Um, but I got to actually tune into a little bit of it, and I was watching it. It's a cool show. I have to, you know, I have to give you credit. You know your stuff. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate it. I mean, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is that really makes the show different is that people are going to be able to really participate. You can follow along and do some of the same activities we're doing with dogs to see how they think. You can do it at home with your dog and follow along, and I think that's going to be super fun for people. Now, just so people know a little bit about you, your background, you are, you do have a Ph.D. in biological anthropology from Harvard University. I did survive my Ph.D., that's right. And then you're Associate Professor of Evolutionary Anthropology at Duke University and a member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, a division of the Duke Institute for Brain Science, uh, Sciences, and you founded Duke Canine Cognition Center. What is that, exactly that? Uh, it is uh, the first on-campus center where it's, only, it, it's completely dedicated to trying to better understand how dogs think and solve problems. And uh, not only do we make original discoveries, but we also then apply that knowledge to real-world problems. So we work with uh, bomb-sniffing dogs, we work with service dogs, and we try to find ways to understand how dogs think to then improve their ability to help people. Now, also, you and your wife actually have a best-selling book out there, The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think. I would imagine you can find that book in bookstores. You can find it online, correct? Anywhere that you find books being sold, it's there. That's right. Now, I'm going to have you actually um, say this name because I'm not even going to attempt it, but Germany's most prestigious award for scientists under the age of 40. What was that called? That's what you received. <laughs> I can't pronounce it either. No? But it was for, awarded by the Humboldt Foundation. Yeah, it's a recipient of the Sofia Kowalewskaya Award. That's right. It was a, he's a famous <laughs> that Russian? mathematician. A German. German? It sounded Russian. Well, maybe the way I said it sounded Russian. Yeah, she was she was Russian, but the but the uh, the the foundation is German. Oh, okay, okay. okay so okay. the name is Russian, yeah. named well, after her. Then you're right. Then I did say it, maybe right. Huh? You got it right. It's like Kovalayevska. Yeah, I'm it. from Poland, so I mean, I was making an attempt on that one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 2007, actually, you received the Smithsonian Magazine named uh, you one of the top 37 U.S. scientists under the age of 36. Congratulations on everything. Oh, thanks, thanks. It's been a lot of fun, and I mean, the truth is that it was in trying to understand dogs better uh, that I guess people got excited about, you know, our research, um, because, you know, for a very long time, science has ignored dogs, thinking they're totally unremarkable, and really, the some of the main things that we discovered was exactly what it is that makes dogs remarkable, and, you know, obviously, um, such an important part of our lives. You know, and, and the show premieres, actually, during um, its... Uh Bark Fest weekend for Nat Geo Wild, and it's going to be on May 15th, and it's 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time. And it's interesting to see some of the tests that you do on these dogs. I think more than anything, though, it was interesting. For me, I kind of sat there looking at it going, you know, people don't give animals enough to say that they're intelligent or that they have a brain, and dogs easily forget. And y your tests that you do kind of prove a lot of that wrong. Well, I think the notion we have in in society, even with humans, is that you either are smart or you are not smart. And that just doesn't hold up to the best science. The way that science, and especially you know, cognitive psychologists, think about intelligence is there are different types of intelligence, and they vary independently. And now that may seem you know, like a funny thing to say, but it's, all I'm saying is you have friends who are really good at English, some that were really good at math in school, some that were really good at history. And they weren't good at, you know, the person who was really good at English isn't necessarily good at math. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. And the same thing applies for dogs, is they're dogs that have certain skills that they're really good at. And if you play lots of games with them, you can find out what it is about your dog, your individual dog, that makes it so special and how it thinks. 
That's an, and yeah, I, I totally understand that. I mean, when I was in school, I was horrible in algebra. <laughs> there you go. So, but, so you know, uh, you know, your your dog may be the exact same way. Where you know, if you play a series of games with your dog, your dog, like my dog, uh, when we play uh, a series of cognitive games, we find that he is very empathic, but he's not very reliant on his working memory. That's not what I thought. I was really surprised. I actually thought he was going to be very reliant on his working memory, so how well he remembers things. But he's actually super empathic, which I would not have guessed before we played these games with him. Dr. Brian Hare, don't go away. We'll be right back. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back with Dr. Brian Hare. Of course, he is the host of the show on Nat Geo Wild. And you can check it out on May 15th, 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time. And, uh, of course, it's called Is Your Dog a Genius? You're listening to... Talking Pets. Listen, cat people, it's just litter. Until you realize those big boxes mean big smells, big messes, and big money. Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter with concentrated power. It guarantees less smells, less work, all with less litter. Try the small bag that lasts one cat 30 days and you'll realize it's just litter. Unless it's World's Best Cat Litter. Find it at Target, Walmart, and at your local grocery and pet stores. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com And you're listening to Talking Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Lisa Santonzi. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. And I'm Zach Buden. You know, and we were speaking, of course, with Dr. Brian Hare. He's the host on Nat Geo Wild, Is Your Dog a Genius, which uh, airs May 15th at 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time. Dr. Hare, with, you, with your show, um, Is Your Dog a Genius, it's three episodes, correct? That's right. It'll be on the 15th, 16th, and 17th at 10 p.m. on Nat Geo Wild. I've got a question for you, Dr. Hare. This is Dr. Uh, Dr. Vinny. Um, Very cool. Regarding uh, the differences in, in dog um, emotions or, or dog intelligence from one pet to another, you attribute this more to just individual variation within a breed, or do you see this because of the way the brains have, uh, have been bred and the shapes have changed because of the shape of the skull? Do you see it more within breed, uh, between breeds? Okay, so that's really interesting. Uh, so there's about 200 breeds uh, if you take, for instance, the AKC Kennel Club's list. Uh, most of those breeds uh, have existed since really the Victorian age, so about 150 years. And what we know is that to um, you know, measure their cognition, you have to play lots of games with them, and you need to play with a group of dogs. So you need be able to compare 200 different breeds to understand how the different breeds think, you'd need 30 or 50 dogs per breed. That's a lot of dogs, right? So right. you'd have to multiply 50 times 200. And no one's really done that. No one's actually collected enough data to look at all the different breeds to know how they really solve problems. So uh, on breeds, what I can tell you is that, number one, the science is really um, lacking, but that's what dognition is all about. It's the uh, it's the it's the um, games that you can play. You go online and sign up, and you can play the games that'll be on the Nat Geo Wild show. That's what dognition is all about. If everybody signs up, plays these games, then we're all going to learn about breed differences that we all desperately want to know about. And that's assuming that you know what your dog's breed is. 
<laughs> That's right. And we and when you register, you can say that it's like for me, I have a, a shelter dog, and yeah, I have to me say, too. You know, my dog's an other. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a shelter vet, and we have a shelter dog, and she's a alien creature. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Doctor Hare, do you remember the guy? Do you remember Stanley Corn? Of course. Yeah, Stanley, actually, he was on my show years and years ago when he brought out the book, the in, I think it was The Intelligence of Dogs or That's something. That's right, yeah. And um, he ranked the dogs from one to whatever. And, of course, the number one dog back then was the Border Collie, I believe. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the dumbest dog, if that's what you want to call it, I believe, I think was the Afghan. So, so what I'm saying is I'm actually rejecting the idea mm -hmm. that you can rank dogs like that. That's so interesting to hear because uh, same thing with me. I mean, Vince and I have been veterinarians for 12 years, and we always learned border collies and standard poodles are supposed to be the smartest, or or maybe they're just the easy easiest to train. So, so, so I, I like did a great job at the time for yeah. you know the state of the art. Mm -hmm. um, but if you read his book and you read actually the published papers and the peer reviewed literature, the work was done by asking people their opinion. Mm. of how obedient different mm -hmm. breeds were. So in yes. modern psychology, to study cognition or intelligence, you actually have to play games. You have right. to see how an animal solves problems. You have to go out and measure and watch it solve problems. And right. as we've started to do that with dogs, the idea that there's some kind of linear continuum you know, or hierarchy towards you know, perfection where border collies are the top and Afghans are the bottom, it totally doesn't make any sense at all. So basically, that was all just anecdotal evidence in the past. Well, it was the best thing available at the time, and we yeah. know much more than that now. Cool. You know what I thought was interesting, too? In episode one, people will see where, and, I, and pardon me for not remembering the, her name, but there was a young woman that you had, and she was in a wheelchair, and she was able to teach her, her uh, CCI dog um, sign language. That's right. Wallace Brosnan and uh, her dog, um, Caspin, who has like, got to be one of my favorite dogs I've ever met, um, can do all sorts of things to help Wallace. She um, uses a wheelchair to get around, and he can do everything from pick up coins on the floor and put it in a Coke machine for her if she drops her money. Uh, she, you know, he um, uh, also understands, and this is, I think, what you're referring to, uh, 50 different uh, gestures mm -hmm. that she's taught him um, subsequent from his training at Canine Companions for Independence, um, which is a little bit like the Harvard of service dogs, uh, um, training schools. And so, right. you know, I don't know, maybe that's not surprising. He learned these 50 signals and has gone off to be an amazing dog. But yes, he's featured in, and so cool. Well, the one thing that I loved about your show, too, is just the tests, just watching how the dogs reacted to the tests. And, and, and you time it so well that you go out to a commercial break or you go to something else and you, you make you... I sit there going, what's the dog going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so it's produced very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, I think what people think about science is that scientists know all the answers. And the truth is, the reason I have to go measure things, the reason that I have to go play games with dogs is because I don't know what they're going to do. And so, you know, I actually had a lot of fun making this TV show and seeing what the different dogs did playing these different games. So I was right there with you. I didn't know what they were going to do either. And then, you know, that's what's always so fun and funny. You know, I laugh a lot during the show just because... You're surprised. You're surprised that they're able to solve a problem, or you're surprised that they can't solve a problem. And so it's really fun to see what these different dogs do. I have a question, Dr. Hare. If your dog is visually impaired, is there a way to do these tests or these games? If That's harder. It's yeah. true. It's a good question. We have that every once in a while where people um, ask that. Most of the games do rely on dogs having, you know, sort of regular, you know, visual acuity because... Most of them involve hiding a tree or seeing mm -hmm. a signal from a human, uh, and we just haven't yet gotten to the point where we've designed cognitive games for um, right. you know dogs that are impaired in terms of their sight. But uh, you know, let's hope that we do that. And I, I think it'd be fascinating to see as a dog starts to lose their vision, do they start relying on other abilities more? Right. Yeah. Well, I know she definitely relies on her s sense of smell and hearing tremendously, but. Yeah, she she can't see much. And that was an interesting factor that he talks about, you see on the show, where they discuss the fact that, you know, is the dog knowing this from sight, from memory, from smell? And, you know, we'll let people watch the episodes to actually see what the answer to that one is. But it's a great show, and congratulations on it. Dr. Brian Hare 
Is Your Dog a Genius? It starts Friday, May 15th at 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time, and it's uh, part of Nat Geo Wild's BarkFest weekend on Nat Geo Wild. So check it out. Dr. Brian Hare, thanks so much for joining us here on the show. It was a great pleasure and an honor. Oh, this is great fun. Thanks, guys. Look Thank for, you. Look Thank forward you, to having Dr. you back again. Oh, we'll do it. Sounds Definitely. good. Sounds good. Take care. You too. That's Dr. Brian Hare. Check it out. Is your dog a genius? You're going to love this show. Starts Friday, May 15th, 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time, 9 Central, and it's on Nat Geo Wild. It's part of Nat Geo Wild's BarkFest weekend, and that's Dr. Brian Hare. Uh, great pleasure having him on. Coming up now, we're going to be speaking um, out of this break with Joanne Lindenmeyer from Humane Society International Senior Manager for Disaster Operations. We're going to be talking about the Nepal disaster, um, the earthquake out there, and the situation involving not only the domesticated animals, but the wild animals and, of course, uh, the farm animals as well. We'll be right back. Don't go away. You're listening to Talking Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Lisa Santonzi. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. And Zach Buden. 844-287-2876. Pick up the phone and give us a call. Check us out at TalkingPets.com and join us on Facebook and Twitter. Hi, Jill. I see you and Bella are enjoying this lovely day as well. It's a perfect day for a walk. Isn't that right, Bella? And what a colorful ID tag you have, Bella. It certainly puts my Rusty's boring engraved tag to shame. Isn't it great? It's a dog tag art tag. Dog tag art? Yeah. Dog tag art makes the world's coolest pet ID tags. Pick from hundreds of cute designs or upload your photos or artwork to create a unique tag of your own. They even give you four lines of text on the back of the tag for important contact information. I love it! But do they hold up? We have to replace Rusty's metal tags so often because the information wears away. Dog tag art tags are some of the highest quality pet tags out there. They're made with super durable stainless steel. Your information is always legible and the tags are guaranteed for life. Well, I'm sold. Where can I get my dog tag art tag for Rusty? Dogtagart.com Sounds great! We can't wait to get online and get a tag of our own. Dogtagart.com We keep best friends together. Use the coupon code RADIO for a 25% discount off any tag. Amazing Pet Expos is coming to a city near you. Admission is always free and your pet is welcome. Shopping, adoptions, free nail trims, discounted shots and microchipping, agility, a pet costume contest, and much more. Plus, meet the guys from Animal Planet's hit TV series Tank and Pit Boss online at AmazingPetExpos.com. Bring your pets to the Pet Expo! Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com And you're listening to Talking Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Lisa Santonzi. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. A spotlight with Dr. Vince Santonzi. Dr. Santonzi, uh, heartworm. A lot of people are concerned about that. Can you... Just explain to everybody, um, you know, in a couple of seconds, what is heartworm? Well, heartworm is a uh, it's a type of worm that uh, gets into the dog's blood via mosquitoes, and it's a concern now because as summer is approaching and the weather is getting warmer, mosquitoes become more you know, more present. Uh, heartworm is is going to boom. Now, and when you when you say the summer is coming, what about in your your winter months, your fall months, your spring months? Should people be concerned about should, heartworm? Yeah, because it, it takes a certain number of days at a certain temperature. So even if, even in colder or colder climates, traditionally colder cl- climates or colder months, if there's a warm spell uh, for you know even two weeks and um, and there's mosquitoes out at that time, then heartworm can can be passed. So and it can last five to seven years inside a dog. So you should definitely be uh, concerned about heartworm no matter where in the country you live. Like I say, it's passed by mosquitoes, and uh, it, it grows, ends up in the heart, and causes a lot of damage to dog and cat, heart and lungs. So it's totally preventable. Um, there are plenty of heartworm prevention products on the market, and uh, folks should 
see their veterinarians uh, about putting their dog on a heartworm prevention, regardless of where they live. Now, when you say heartworm country. prevention, is that a, a daily? Is that a weekly? Is that a monthly? It's, they, they, in the past, they have had daily tablets, but it's a usually a monthly uh, tablet, chewable tablet, which dogs like, or a monthly uh, topical that you squirt on the skin, usually between the shoulder blades. And uh, that will, uh, they even have a, a, an injectable product now that lasts for six months. So there are a number of ways, uh, convenient ways as well, to um, prevent your dog from getting heartworms. Because if your dog does get heartworms, then um, it's a very dangerous disease and it's very expensive uh, and invasive to treat. And another good reason why in the summer months now that they're approaching when you have maybe fountains or water stagnant water oh yeah uh, mosquitoes will right you know be born there and then right. yeah dump it out make sure. sure you get rid of all the water absolutely another reason to do that well once again you are listening to talking pets give us a call at 844-287-2876 And you're listening to Talking Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Santonzi. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. And I'm the Funny Bear. 844-287-2876 is the number. 844-287-2876. I want to welcome onto the program Joanne Lindenweyer, Humane Society International's Senior Manager for Disaster Operations. Um, she's here, actually, um, animal victims of Nepal's earthquake are receiving emergency aid from the Humane Society International's veterinary medical team. And... Uh, Joanne Lindenmeyer, thanks so much for joining us here on Talking Pets. Hi, John, and everyone else. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm and I thank you for your invitation. I, uh, right off the bat, I want to ask you what what is the difference between other than I guess locations? Because there's Humane Society of the United States, there's Humane Society, which is your organization, international, and you guys work hand in hand. Is that how that is? You deal with everything outside of America. <laughs> Yes, we are uh, we are a uh, an offshoot of the Humane Society of the United States, so they are our parent organization, and that, that's exactly right. The Humane Society of the United States deals almost entirely with domestic issues, and we deal with everything else. And that's HSI, if you want to do you know an abbreviation on that, of course, and that's probably the way I'll refer to it. You mean Society International? But you know, everybody's seen it on the news. Um, everything that happened in Nepal with the earthquake and all, and how devastating it was. And you know, occurrences like this are not anything that you can plan for. Um, you know, it's not something that you expect. And this was devastating not only for the people um, of that region, but also the animals. Correct? Absolutely. In fact, I would say that it's uh, well, it's equally devastating, as many of your listeners know. Um, you, you know, we have a very close bond with animals. In some cases, it's pets, and uh, people in Nepal really love their dogs, so there's a very strong bond there. But then they also depend to a great deal on their animals, such as goats and sheep and cows, for their livelihood. So um, the devastation that's wrought upon the animal populations affects human populations as well. Now, are you working with other organizations hand-in-hand hand? Um, besides, you know, of course, the Humane Society International, but are there other organizations, national, international organizations that you're working with? Uh, there are, and I would say that uh, there's a really wonderful effort on the ground to coordinate among various animal welfare organizations so that we respond efficiently and effectively to this disaster and this tragedy. Uh, among those are World Veterinary Services, um, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, World Animal Protection, and a number of other smaller groups. Those are probably the larger ones. But they are uh, they get together, they coordinate what their schedules for the day. They have a, 
a plan that involves all of the organizations and everybody sets out to a certain place because the needs are really the same regardless of where you are. We don't want to be stepping, you know, we don't want to be duplicating efforts, certainly, in a, in a, in a disaster such as this. That's probably one of the worst things that could happen. And um, we want to make sure that we all reach as many people in need and as many animals in need as possible. I understand, actually, and if I'm saying this correct, um, Sengden Village, a remote village outside of Kathmandu, 85% mm-hmm. of the houses were leveled, and people or animals right now are living in tents. That is correct, and in fact, uh, I would say not in Kathmandu, there are thousands of temporary shelters that have been put up, not just some of them by the government, but most of them just on the spot in a market where there were tents available or, or um material available to shield people from the sun. Outside of Kathmandu, there are fewer. They seem to have been set up by the government. And you're exactly right. People are living in tents. And one of the problems with that has been that uh, it's it's rained this week. It's a little bit short of the dry, of the rainy season, that is. And uh, unfortunately, this past week, there's been quite a bit of rain. So people are not only living outside, but they really are somewhat exposed not only to rain, but it's been quite cold. So that has really compounded the misery. I saw actually on the news, uh, watching one of the news channels, where a lot of the humans, the people there, um, I guess ceremonial-wise, they they were burning the bodies. And does that happen with the animals out there too? I mean, the animals that have passed and that have found, how do they... Mm -hmm. How do they... how, what do they well, do with the bodies with, uh, of, of, of all these animals? Well, you know, that's a, it's an interesting question because that is something that most people would consider when they're thinking about a disaster such as this. Um, the animals, of course, come second. People, we're, we're trying to rescue people and pull out bodies, human bodies first. But um, h- how to dispose of those animals is a real challenge. And there are going to be many, many of them. Uh, animals tended to live under the houses that collapsed. So people have lost many of them, including livestock. Um, I would say it's probably less so for dogs. But I don't believe there have been any decisions yet about how to do this type of, of mass, um, of, of mass, whether they're going to bury them. I think burial is unlikely just because the landscape doesn't really lend itself to that and the rains will be coming soon. So I would imagine that we might see some mass uh, uh, pyres that are where, where the, the uh, bodies are actually burned. But that, as far as I know, has not yet been decided. Now, Joanne, uh, Humane Society International, you guys are going in there and you're helping with what, like the veterinary care in, in terms of medicines and vaccinations and and supplies like food and water and all is that's that's what exactly. you're doing exactly exactly and as it turns there are a number of veterinarians over there right now we have four on our team uh some of the other organizations that i mentioned had veterinarians but to be honest with you uh, doing uh, uh surgery in the middle of although some of it is being done they're trying to reach as, a, as many animals as possible and Sometimes it's difficult to have the supplies that you need to do complicated surgeries. So while they are treating as many animals as they possibly can, given their resources, um, most of the work is going into rescuing animals, uh, feeding and watering them. For the cattle and for the cows and the livestock that lived under the houses, many of the houses collapsed on top of not only the animals but also the food stocks. And so the animals have very little access to the food they're used to eating. And so feeding and watering and rescuing still becomes uh, a a priority. And then vaccinations, because after you have the first phase of a tragedy such as this, the next phase is one that will be uh, a phase of infectious diseases. And so vaccinating dogs against rabies, and, and sure. livestock against uh, foot and mouth disease, and there may be some other vaccines that are incorporated into that, but those are the main things. The animals are exposed to the elements. Some of the livestock are developing respiratory illnesses, and of course, 
the number of dogs that are not owned that are in the streets is quite high, and there's concern um, always in a situation like this, such a for a rabies outbreak. Right. Yeah. Uh, hey, Joanne, this is Dr. Vince. Um, are you guys setting up uh, shelters for animals that are stray and just uh, the families may have been killed? Or? We are talking about that. We're actually trying to assess the situation as we speak. Um, so I can't really comment on that. I will say that we're ready to go if the team on the ground decides that we should be setting up shelters. It's sometimes difficult to know. We, we probably would not be setting up shelters for uh, unowned dogs just because what do you, you know, what what do you do with them? There are so many that I think it's physically impossible to find uh, a suitable place to keep them and to feed them all. So we are assessing the needs of people who own animals who are not able to care for them at this moment as well as the needs of people in the camps, some of the temporary camps, some of them set up by the government, and trying to assess whether there is a need for shelter. Um, there, there, are, there are some resources in Nepal. The Humane Society has been involved in, Humane Society International has been involved in Nepal for a long time, and it may be that we transition into a longer-term phase there, which is something that we've done in other countries Joanne, after a disaster such as this. Mm-hmm. Hold on to that thought. We're going to take a little break. We're going to come back with you. Joanne Lindenmeyer, Humane Society International Senior Manager for Disaster Operations. We'll find out how people can donate, too, and help out the uh, Humane Society International and the work that they're doing over there in Nepal. But once again, you are listening to Talking Pets. Give us a call if you have a question at 844-287-2876. Active for Pets is a new wellness platform and app that helps pet parents save time and money on their vet bills. Stop paying for unnecessary vet treatments. Consult with a vet online. Get unlimited access to your pet's entire health history from any computer or smartphone with the Active for Pets app. Vaccinations, medications, test results, and more. Active for Pets gives you access to a team of expert vets for non-emergency care. Make an appointment before, during, or after office hours. Skip the waiting room and get a secure online vet consult on your schedule. Taking care of your pets is as easy as it gets with Active for Pets. Ready to try Active 4 Pets? Listeners get 40% off a one-year membership. To get this great offer, use promo code PETLIFE on the sign-up page of Active4Pets.com. That's A-C-T-I-V, the number 4, P-E-T-S dot com. Or call 888-512-2848. Hi, I'm Dana Humphrey, also known as the Pet Lady. I travel from coast to coast to pet trade shows and consumer events to scout out what the hottest, hippest, and most unique pet products are on the planet, bringing you tips and tricks from top veterinarians, groomers, trainers on how to safely travel and live happily with your pets. The Pet Lady will be in a city near you, showing off the latest and greatest tech pet gadgets, cozy comforts, and fab gift ideas for man's and woman's best friend. You can learn more at thepetlady.net or connect socially and tweet with me at Pet Lady World. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com And once again, you're listening to Talking Pets. I'm John Patch. I'm Dr. Vince Santonzi. The number is 844-287-2876, 844-287-2876. We're speaking with Joanne Lindenmeyer, Humane Society International's Senior Manager for Disaster Operations. Bobby, a lot of the music that you're playing here, is that music of Nepal? Yeah, traditional music from Nepal. And um, Joanne, um, Dr. Vince has another question for you. 
Hey, Joanne, um, I assume that there's a lot of use being made of, uh, of rescue dogs. Are there quite a few rescue dogs involved in this operation? There are, but um, those are obviously being brought in by the humanitarian organizations that rescue people. So, yes. And, what are you and, doing? Um, oh, go ahead. What are you doing in the remote areas? Um, I, are these dogs and people yourselves um, able to get into these areas? Because I understand there's a lot of mountainous areas that you know are very difficult to get to. Yes, and, and actually, that probably remains our biggest challenge. There are everybody is pretty much working out of Kathmandu right now, which is the capital. But the remoter areas have been are really inaccessible because of landslides and the many aftershocks of pretty severe magnitude that have accompanied the initial uh, the initial earthquake. So we have really, uh, it's been quite difficult to assess what the needs are in these local areas, but tomorrow a plan was being made to try to get out into the more rural areas. We suspect that that's where some of the livestock uh, losses are going to be greater because obviously people with small farms uh, with livestock live outside the city in the more remote villages and they are very difficult to get to. They're on mount, mountainous areas and the roads are have been uh, impassable. So that we're, we're working on that and uh, I think what we may do is that it might be that we have to actually airlift some people into some of these areas or the plan right now is also to engage the animal rescue, animal welfare uh, organizations that do exist in some of these more remote areas, uh, engage them as partners and try to help them out that way. And how is Nepal's um, uh, internal um, animal uh, uh, organization? I mean, do, do they have a lot of, uh, you know, integral animal rescue organizations and, and animal welfare organizations within Nepal? There are a great many animal welfare organizations in Nepal. Most of them are quite small. I would say that the two that are the largest is the, are the Animal Wel Welfare Network of Nepal, AWNN, which is a coalition of rescue groups, as well as the Kathmandu Animal Treatment Center and the Bhaktapur Animal Welfare Society. So there are a number of them, and then some smaller agencies, but uh, Nepal, because of the Nepalese people, are very devoted to their animals, and uh, animal welfare is high up on their list. Joanne, how do people um, help out? I mean, because I know, I know your organization, the Humane Society International, is also helping people over there along all that yes. you're doing with the animals, so um, your efforts are you know, twofold, threefold, and, you know, it goes on and on. But how do people help specifically for the animals? Like, can they make donations to you guys at, U at the Humane Society International? And, and how do they find out more information about what's going on over there? Well, the best place to do that, which, which actually serves both of those purposes, so I'm going to give you a website uh, right now. It's www.h.hsi.org forward slash disaster. And if people wish to donate, there's a, a button on that website that will allow them to make a donation of their choice. But we also have a lot of slides and some text that accompany that. And um, they're pretty dramatic photographs. If people want to find out exactly what our team is doing, that's where they'll, they'll find out the best information at this time. Joanne, can you give us that uh, website one more time? I will. www dot hsi dot org forward slash disaster okay so www dot hsi dot org forward Correct. slash disaster and you can find out that's more information right. about the efforts that's going on with the Humane Society International and also make donations there as well Joanne Lindenmeyer, I want to thank you for joining us here on the program and filling us in on everything that's going on over there and hopefully our listeners across America and beyond We'll help your efforts out and make some donations to that website. Well, thank you very much, Sean, for inviting me. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you to uh, people who are on the other end listening to this program. Americans are, are very generous people, and, um, and we're in need of help right now from uh, anybody who wishes to donate. So thank you again for everything. Thanks, Joanne. Keep up the good work, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you. That's Joanne Linden.
Joanne Lindenmeyer, Humane Society International Senior Manager for Disaster Operations. Um, great efforts with the Humane Society yeah, International. Really. So, um, and thank you so much, Joanne. You know, the thing is, like, too, like we, she was just saying, you know, the average person, even if you can donate like a dollar, two dollars, whatever you can donate, uh, would be great. But then you have these big organizations that, um, you know, I can start naming some, but have millions and billions of dollars. And it's mm. basically a write-off for them as a charity or as a donation. So if these yeah. people can, you know, dig into their pockets in this instance and help out, I know a lot of them do. Um, a lot of them are. But um, for the animals that need to help out there, like Joanne was just telling us, you know, so many animals, thousands of animals sure. have lost their lives. And there's thousands more that need help. And the scary part that I was trying to get to with her was the fact that in these mountainous areas where the cattle are and the goats and all this that, you know, are d dead, um, and they start to decay, you know, water runs down. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of wonder, you know, she talked about the respiratory problems out there already and diarrhea is kicking in and um, all those aspects. So you kind of wonder in the long run, if they don't clean up those bodies, both human and animal, what kind of illness and disease is going to, you know, come in the near future. So they need help. Absolutely. So these yeah. organizations that can help need to help. So again, it's uh, www.hsi.org. Disa forward slash disaster. So help them out. That's Joanne Lindenmeyer, Humane Society International Senior Manager for Disaster Operations, Humane Society International. And a big thank you to Dr. Brian Hare. Is your dog a genius? Check it out on May 15th at 10 p.m. Eastern Pacific Time on Nat Geo Wild. And uh, for myself, John Patch. Dr. Lisa Santonzi. Dr. Vince Santonzi. Bob Page. And Zach Buden. We say goodbye for this hour of Talking Pets. Don't forget, spay and neuter your pets and help control that pet population. And if you're looking to adopt a dog, go to your local animal shelter or your rescue group and get a dog from there. But again, make a donation to hsi.org forward slash disaster and help Nepal's animals. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>